Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we have Parker Merritt of Coinmetrics to go through all things Q2 data. We talk about hash rate, mining revenue, energy costs, and much more. This podcast is presented ad-free by Compass Mining, the largest marketplace for Bitcoin mining. Check out compassmining.io today if you want to buy, sell, or host an ASIC. And now, onto the show. Parker, welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Thanks, thanks for uh, joining us today. I appreciate your time. Hey, Will. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. Cool. I'm really excited to jump into today's topic. We always do the quarterly review with Coinmetrics. You guys are a great data provider for Mining Memo, our newsletter, and then just also general in space. You guys are the leader in terms of data. So we really appreciate your expertise. And of course, we're going to go over Bitcoin mining data. For those out there who appreciate the Ethereum data we did last time, sorry, you're going to have to uh, find that data yourself because we're not doing it this time. But lots to dig into Bitcoin mining revenues. Uh, Bitcoin mining fees, ASIC profitability across different classes. And then even at the end, we'll get into some uh, like zero hop and one hop metrics, which are also really interesting. And Coinmetrics did a really great blog post about that. I think a few weeks ago, we'll, we'll talk about. But Parker, I'll let you jump into it with the, the first set of slides. Uh, for those listening on the podcast, we do have a YouTube version of this, which will be a little bit better to watch as you can follow along with the images but we'll be describing the charts and graphs as we go along. So you should be able to keep up with this as we go along. Excellent. All right. Yeah, I'll go ahead and dive in. So, um, you know, just like last time, I figured we'd start out with maybe some more of the fundamentals um, and then dig into a little bit more of the, the nuanced analysis. So just to kick things off, um, you know, the, the main metric that everybody looks at in terms of monitoring the health of the Bitcoin mining ecosystem, of course, is Bitcoin hash rate. So I don't know if there's any uh, color commentary you want to provide here, Will, but obviously, you know, the main thing to look at here is probably that it's it's definitely flatlined a bit, you know, um, yeah. and and, you know, just to kind of provide some context, of course, there's no direct way to measure hash rate on chain, but we can sort of deduce it indirectly from looking at, uh, you know, the mean block time intervals as well as the difficulty. And so what we have here is sort of a uh, you know, real-time measure of mean hash rate as well as a 30-day rolling average. And right here towards the beginning of July, we've seemed to have leveled out right around uh, 215 exahash per second. So you know, those of uh, us who have been predicting 300 exahash by the end of the year are maybe eating our words a little bit right now. But yeah, the, the growth has certainly slowed down a little bit. Yeah, normally when we talk about a hash rate, it's pretty hand wavy. It's like, there's not much to talk about besides extremely bullish predictions that are very similar to Bitcoin price predictions. But a lot of the predictions I got from the beginning of the year, which was like 300, 350 exahash even was some people on the podcast talked about, they are going to be wrong. They have to be wrong. Uh, looking at the public minor disclosures, which just rolled in for the month of June, everyone is basically either discounting the future hash rate growth uh, or at least saying they're not going to, well, yeah, that Buzz says it right. They're, they're not going to hit their measurements. They're, they're, uh, discounting it quite heavily. So, uh, I would expect this to sit around 215 to the upper side, 250 would be really good by the end of the year. But even then I'm seeing like some of these disclosures again from public mining firms, it looks bad. Like there's a lot of machine orders that I think are going to be canceled or sold onto secondary markets. There's still huge hosting problems uh, with large providers out there. Marathon is still having tons of problems getting its hash rate online. And I think you're just going to continue to see like this hash rate value stick around the same place, which is great for mining difficulty, right? Because we'll get into that in a second with hash price. But you don't want to see the hash rate go up because difficulty goes up and follows it. And then your hash price goes down and all these S19s and other machines would decrease in profitability. So this is actually bullish news for miners right. uh, at the very least. So good news to start the show. Good good choice on the slide. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a silver lining there. And again, you know, we don't have a whole lot of data here in this particular presentation about the public miners. But I, I mean, I agree, of course, you know, the, the public disclosures from those companies make it seem like uh, growth is going to slow down a little bit. Uh, I will say, you know, a lot of them have also been liquidating their treasuries uh, in order to continue financing, you know, the ASICs they have on order right now. So I'm, I'm not expecting to see like a, a dramatic pullback. I think these deployments are going to continue to roll out and we'll see, see continued growth throughout the rest of the year. But yeah, it definitely won't be at that continued pace of uh, breakneck growth that we saw after the, the China exodus. 
yeah, there was some crazy hash rate predictions. I think Marathon's keeping its 200,000 units online by early 2023 prediction. Mm -hmm. But I've seen a few others like Iris Energy, I think, dropped their prediction from, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I probably am wrong here, but it's like 15x a hash back down to like five plus X a hash. So there's a decent amount of of changes for exahash predictions. Of course. And, you know, on the topic of marathon, I mean, you know, anything can happen. I saw that uh, recently there was a thunderstorm that took out about 75% of their operations. So you really never know when a, a black swan like that is going to come take out a, a swath of hash rate. Oh, totally. Yeah. That hard insight got, got nailed. Mm -hmm. right, cool. But yeah. We'll, we'll jump to the next one. And so, yeah, I, I guess last time, you know, we did focus a good bit on hash price and hash value, which I, I included a few charts just to provide an update look at that. But I think another interesting way of looking at difficulty and difficulty adjustments is, you know, based on uh, what metric is actually, you know, a direct input into that, which is uh, the target block time of 10 minutes. And so just to describe for your listeners on audio, um, essentially what this shows here is up at the top in purple, we have our difficulty adjustments. So that's just uh, ratcheting up and down uh, the actual, you know, um, amount of hashes that have to be expended by a miner on average to find a block. And then below that, we have um, sort of this wavering indicator. It's a 14 day um, rolling average of the mean block time interval. So that's the time in between each block on average. And you can see here how the difficulty adjustments respond directly to that rolling mean block interval. You can see um, right around July 2021, when we had the China exodus, uh, mean block time went as much as 15 minutes, uh, well above our 10 minute average. So we had a, a pretty massive difficulty adjustment downward from there. And you can see we've we've continued to wave around um, you know, the, the 10 minute average, but one thing I think is interesting is obviously, you know, with continued growth of hash rate, on average, um, the mean block time is is well below that 10 minutes uh, hanging around nine, nine and a half. So I just thought that was another interesting way of visualizing the relationship between mean block time and uh, our difficulty adjustments. Yeah, the July 2021 metric there is really interesting. It's also interesting to look at last month's, so June uh, 2022. There was definitely like longer blocks that month. There was a few blocks that took a really long time. And so I wonder how much those blocks play into like the the medium block time or the average block time here. But for the most part, you also see that it did increase a little bit, which makes sense, right? We had right. Um, a lot of hash rate come offline uh, or at least like not deploy. We saw some miners get priced out and start turning off. And so that increased block time even just slightly. I mean, it's, Obviously, not as dramatic as what happened after China, where just a huge portion of the network had to turn off very quickly. And that right. led to very different block times. But it is interesting to see the effect of price on uh, block time right there in last month, June 2021. Exactly. I think just for those listening on the podcast, I'm trying to decipher what values we have there. Is that like a almost 11, like a 10 and a half second block time for, yeah. for June? Ten and a half minutes, yeah. Oh yeah, ten and a half minutes. Yeah, and of course, that's on average. You know, block. it's probabilistic, so you could have a lot of variation in that. You know, some blocks could take as long as you know twenty, thirty minutes. Some could be confirmed instantly. So you know, again, this is a, a rolling average, but yeah, that that fourteen week kind of window is what the you know network is looking at in terms of making those adjustments. So yeah, it's definitely and, a very cool metric to look at. And, and just to provide a little bit more color on that, you know, I, I thought this was another interesting one, uh, just kind of zooming out on that same set of metrics. You can see here we spent uh, quite a bit of time below that target block time uh, around that 2013, 2014 era. And, you know, it was nothing but upwards difficulty adjustments there. Um, and that was probably related to the fact that ASICs were, you know, just becoming a thing and difficulty was ramping up very quickly. So, uh, again, you know, for, for miners who complain about any upwards difficulty adjustments, it can always be worse. It definitely can always get worse. Uh, Mitch Klee, who's a, uh, a mining analyst at Compass, had a nice article about this a few months back uh, about how block times have been or how difficulty changes are slowing down like marginally compared to what right. they were in the past. And it's very true, especially looking at this graphic right here. Mm -hmm. It's completely different. That's a cool chart though. Appreciate it. But yeah, so, you know, again, this is all sort of fundamentals, nothing like crazy. You know, this is 
exactly the kind of stuff you expect, um, you know, from the operation of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, maybe something a little bit more interesting for your viewers who are miners is our revenue charts. Um, so this is a, a quarter by quarter um, illustration of the miner revenue. And this is um, both the block subsidy as well as transaction fees. We'll break it down a little bit further here in some of these other slides. But obviously, you know, you can see that um, it's it's slowly been dropping um, the beginning of 2021 Q1, we had just over $4 billion in total minor revenue across the entire network. Um, and Q4 2021 was even better, about $4.5 billion. But um, at the closing of this past quarter, Q2 2022, um, we, we just barely tipped $2.5 in total uh, revenue for all miners across the network. And, you know, uh, obviously, we, we had the big drop in Bitcoin price right at the end of Q2. So I'm expecting... Q3 might might not be so pretty. Yeah, this is rough. So for, again, for those listening on the podcast, what we're looking at is the quarterly Bitcoin mining revenue. Uh, and it's pretty nice, obviously, since like January 2021. There's not a quarter where we're below 3 billion, let alone 3.5 billion until the last two quarters. So that'd be January of this year through March and then March through uh, June. And this month is, or this quarter is pretty bad, right? Uh, well below $3 billion. Uh, that's a lot of money that is just like not going to miners pockets that they expect to go into their pockets, right? Cause you're using like your past historic data to make decisions on your order purchases, your operational build outs and whatnot. And yeah, it's definitely pretty, pretty bleak. Uh, but looking back a few years, like these numbers are really healthy, right? If not healthy, right. these are very bullish numbers. So looking within like a year and a half, 18 month um, time zone at just mining revenue, it does give you a bit of a skewed perspective because if we, if we zoom back further, like even $1 billion in mining revenue for uh, was, was considered pretty healthy or really good. And we've just been blessed with a very high coin base and then also fees aren't, aren't much. And we'll talk about that in the next slide here, but uh, they're definitely somewhat significant. Right. Of course. Yeah. Miners have been a little bit spoiled for the, the past year or two. And it's, it's always ha healthy to have a, a pullback like this because only the most innovative and, you know, sort of under levered miners are going to be the ones that make it through. So uh, again, not the prettiest picture uh, overall, but I think it is perfectly healthy to have a pullback in total network revenue. Um, of course, you know, again, as we were discussing, fees do play a at least increasingly controversial role in terms of the minor revenue discussions. So here, instead of quarter by quarter, you can just see the year to date minor revenue broken down by both block rewards and fees. Um, and obviously, block rewards still make up a massive portion of this. You know, uh, th this is the hot debate on on Twitter, as always. Um, year to date, total minor revenue by block reward is six point two nine billion, um, and the fees are a paltry eighty six million of that. So, so was was throw this over to you. You're the uh, the quasi Bitcoin maximalist. How do you feel about that eighty six million dollar number you're looking at right now? Uh, for this is January twenty twenty to to July 2022. Right. Um, you know, mixed feelings, of course. I would like to see that number higher. And maybe, you know, there's a, a line between me as a Bitcoin maximalist and uh, a Bitcoin miner. You know, uh, of course, I would like to see the, those revenues pumped up uh, for my ASICs personally. Um, you know, and, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I do think you know, we're, we're only thinking about one side of the equation here, and that's the revenues, but also, you know, an important um, element of this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, is cost. I do think, you know, as as miners who are focused on accumulating Bitcoin, you know, this number seems too low to us. I do think long term, uh, as energy providers and, you know, other layers of the power infrastructure stack start getting involved, they're going to accept much lower revenues than people who are strictly focused on accumulating Bitcoin. In addition to that, of course, you know, I, I would like to see ASICs commoditized and become a little bit cheaper. That way, you know, the upfront CapEx that you have to spend in order to get involved in the Bitcoin mining game. I hope that goes down. Um, but yeah, as a miner, you know, you, you want to do nothing but see this number go up. So I, I do think, you know, it would be nice to see some additional base layer use cases that uh, sort of generate more fee revenue. 
That was a very uh, politically correct way of talking about this. I appreciate <laughs> the answer. Uh, it's definitely interesting. And as someone who's a fan of innovative sidechain ideas or even just like L2s in general, I would love to see that fee revenue increase. And maybe even uh, the fact that it's so low over the six months since the beginning of the year, really this dates back to uh, the China ban is basically when we saw this trend emerge July of 2021. So it's been a full year now. Uh, I, I would like to see this cause some pressure on the design decisions around Bitcoin. Um, I hope it is tempered with like a little conservatism, right? Where it's like a five, 10 year project and we experiment and like try out different things. But uh, I, I do hope that changes a little bit. And from like a mining perspective, I like the way you put it as well, right? Just running a Bitcoin miner, I would love to see there's more network usage. And then my miner gets a little cut of that as well, right? I'm The purpose of mining Bitcoin is not only securing the network, it's not only to generate uh, the coin base and earn that, but it's also to move transactions and get a little bit of that fee spread. So far, it's not really happening. And this is a pretty well discussed topic at this point. So we probably don't need to dwell on it too much, but it is just pretty interesting to see this graphic where you have $6.3 billion originating from the Coinbase and a paltry $86 million generated just from fees over the last six months. It's a pretty stark and striking image. Right. And and just to put a, a little bit of a finer point on it, because, you know, of course, people have been kind of pointing out this change in recent months is just, you know, looking at it in terms of the relative amount um, of fees versus block rewards. You know, you can see the total compensation earlier in the year was uh, fees made up about one percent of minor revenue. Um, and, you know, starting in May, we did have a pretty big jump up, you know, in relative terms. Uh, it's sitting around two percent now. So the percentage of rewards that miners are earning from fees has doubled, of course, you know, compared to uh, historic trends. And, you know, I can I can jump to this one real quick. That's still a very small amount um, compared to, you know, in past years, it reached as much as 10, 15, 20, 25 percent. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are taking this as a hopeful sign that it's starting to tick up. So. Yeah, I love that you included this. And for anyone who's watching, I'll describe it or listening, I'll describe it again. 1% fees beginning of the year, 2% fees since May because everyone's liquidating their Bitcoin and <laughs> trying to get it onto an exchange. And then that is giving a bunch of maxis some hope that fees are going to kick back up going into a bear market. At least that's my uh, really unfair interpretation of, of events here. But since, again, July 2021, there is just a walk off a cliff for Bitcoin fees and even a 2% change on a relative base, like that's a nice increase, right? It's like a hundred percent increase or whatever it is. Um, it's still so small. 2% is, is literally nothing. So hopefully it gets back up. Uh, Parker, I ask you on fair question. What do you think would be a healthy fee percent per block for mining rewards that you'd like to see miners garner? Oh man, yeah, that's that's a tough question. You know, in order to give a good answer to that, I feel like I would have to definitely, you know, run a, a more in-depth analysis. I mean, you know, five, ten percent feels healthy, you know, just based mm -hmm. on the historic averages over the past couple of years. Um yeah. but you know, of course, when you start targeting numbers, I, I think you can it's a slippery slope. Um, you know, Bitcoins like to Bitcoiners like to criticize other chains for sort of playing with the mechanics of, you know, fee burning, obviously with EIP 1559 and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, my my politically correct answer, one once again, is the free market will decide. Um, don't want to put too too specific of a number on it. Um, I don't know. What are you thinking? Yeah. It, sorry to put you on the spot, but that's what I like to do on this podcast is ask people right. unfair questions. Uh, I like your five to 10 percent. I think. Most people would say that it feels like a good gut answer for for Bitcoin, and the reason being, it's not it's not like moving money on Zelle, right? I don't need like a very very low fee. Bitcoin enables you to move huge amounts of money, just be how U two XOs are built, how they're monetized, and so you can move huge sums of money for little cost at all. But you'd want that fee to be within a reasonable boundary. Uh, and there's other arguments for it as well. You can get even get into like MEV design stuff about like where blocks are going to go based on um, transaction fees that have been paid in the past. That stuff gets super in depth. But I like the five to ten percent based on a gut feeling and then looking at the past. And to be fair, like 
I knock on the one to two percent fees, but everything so far has been trending upwards in a very general sense. We have the 2017 and 2018 fees and the 2021 and 2022 fees. They're the exception, not the rule. Uh, and those fees are definitely going to be much higher. And they're almost like things you need to throw out to do any proper analysis because they're so high. Because everyone's trying to get Bitcoin onto exchanges. They're trying to do whatever they want with their Bitcoin. And it's just not fair to use them for analysis. Uh, but I like that 5 to 10, 10% range as well. Right. And of course, that's like sort of a, I would guess, a short term goal, because naturally, if the block subsidy is continuing to go away, transaction fees are inevitably going to become 100 percent of the compensation. You know, so this is going to change over time. And, you know, really what you're targeting should change with those conditions. But yeah, for right now, um, I would I would like to see it a little bit higher. But I think the best way of looking at it really is probably more in terms of just like the outstanding dollar amount. Um, so if you go to this next chart, we can see here um, the actual USD fee plotted against sort of the block fullness. And, you know, a couple of things I'd like to point out. Um, number one is that even though we've seen the percentage of fees as a proportion of total minor compensation double from one to two percent, you can see here like the average USD fee really hasn't changed. It's basically flat, if not lower. So I think a large part of that, you know, proportional percentage going higher is just that the uh, block subsidy value in terms of dollars has gone down, whereas people are generally going to pay the same amount in terms of, you know, um, the, the fee market, you know, the the demand for block space. So I think when you're looking at things like a percentage, you have to take into account what's the denominator for that. So that would be the first point I would point out there is that, you know, the average yeah. fee still hasn't changed very much. I've seen a few different tweets about this, which tweets are always just so extremely unfair. Darren Feinstein had one the other day, just doing an aggregate US dollars per fee by fees per year over like the last 10 years for Bitcoin. And it's obvious it's it's trending upwards. So that's a good metric. Uh, I do feel like there has not been a lot of good takes on either side. You, know, you have the Ethereum take that Bitcoin's unsecure, that it needs to change its 21 million policy. Uh, that's just sort of like the straw man for it uh, or the steel man for it. And then on the flip side, you have the Bitcoin maxi arguments, which is let the market decide. It's hard to say, right? It's really difficult to say like what needs to happen here. I think this chart's very interesting. Just look at the dollars. At the end of the day, miners are basing their entire operation in dollars. They're not basing it in Bitcoin. And just look at all the liquidations all these miners are having to do right now. They're liquidating their Bitcoin for dollars. They're not being able to hold their Bitcoin for very much longer. The HODL thing in a lot of ways was a marketing gimmick in my mind's eye. Uh, maybe it was some sort of starry-eyed strategy that projecting 100K Bitcoin and then they dump on everybody. But I, I honestly think there was some sort of marketing thing to it, especially with these public miners who have uh, listed stocks. I think it was just a, a strong strategy for them. And that's, that could change going forward. And I... I I just think like this USD thing is is the thing to watch. The one other thing I want to point out in this image for those listening is we have the average USD fee over the last, say, three years here. And then we also have the block fullness uh, over the last three years. And that's basically showing you the percent of blocks that are full and percent of blocks that are empty. Uh, and that's it's interesting just looking at how healthy the network is. And you really only see completely full blocks during times uh, like during a bull market and during the height of a bull market. And you know, since July, 2021 blocks have not been as full as they used to in the past. Like there's a lot of empty blocks out there. Alex Thorne at Galaxy Digital did a nice piece about this um, asking why in May of 2021, we saw very full blocks, high fees, but uh, November of 2021, we saw less full blocks and lower fees, but a higher Bitcoin price. And he had a few different conclusions about it. Definitely go check out his Twitter account and find his thread on that. Uh, but there's questions about like where retail is in the middle of this, right? And to me, it seems like block fullness is predicated on retail being there or not. And I would say like retail has been gone for quite a while. And that's how you see blocks not being full. Uh, but I'd be curious to get your take on that if you have an opinion one way or the other, or you look at this metric and see something completely different. 
Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, yeah, I completely agree that Alex's report on this was really excellent. Uses lots of coin metrics data. So highly recommend you, you guys go check that out. Um, and yeah, he attributed this uh, sort of change in the fee market dynamics to a number of factors. Obviously, you know, retail is related to that. Um, you know, there, there were some points about minor selling as well. But I think the main thing was he pointed out that, um, you know, there's also been a, a number of efficiency improvements in in sort of Bitcoin's use of block space. And with the SegWit, um, you know, fork in 2017, it was an effective block size increase. So you kind of have to, you know, keep that in mind when sort of looking at these fee market dynamics is even though a lot of Bitcoiners were not very pro increasing the block size, in a way, we did have a block size increase with that fork. And so, you know, block space is being used more efficiently. And therefore, even if we did have the same amount of retail demand, that doesn't necessarily translate directly into higher fees. And the other thing I would point out here is that, you know, it, it's interesting. It's almost like a step function in that blocks are either full or they're not. And, you know, fees are, you know, extremely low compared to where they were in, you know, early to mid 2021. But, um, you know, the block space is still at about 80% usage. So it's, it's not as if, you know, if you have half the block space usage, you have half the fees. It's either your blocks are full and you're generating a fee market or they're not full and the fee market plummets to virtually zero. So those are just a few of the takeaways I had. Yeah, it's really interesting when you get into alternative fee models, which used to actually be a much larger conversation in Bitcoin circles than it is today. Now everyone's gives you the middle finger if you talk about changes to the fee structure for you know good reasons or not. We don't have to delve into that. But the spark for the recent conversation has definitely been EIP-1559, which is almost one year old. EIP-1559 enabled a block to be filled up to 30 million gas or zero gas with a medium block targeting 15 million gas. Uh, for those listening who don't know anything about Ethereum, gas is basically just a metric for understanding how full a block is. Uh, what EIP-1559 enabled you to do was target a 50% full block, and that would help stabilize the fee market. In a lot of ways, it did, right? It helped enable uh, Ethereum to calm down the the variance on fees where you just have these huge demand for block space in moments, and then the fees would get out of whack, and they'd stay out of whack for quite a while. After EIP-1559, you'd have large demand for block space, say, on a specific block. But then because of the fee mechanism, a few blocks later, the whole network would calm down a little bit and you'd get back to a normalized fee. So in some ways, the engineering on it did work, which is very, very interesting. It's not something I see Bitcoin ever implementing, but it is a pretty cool topic when you're just looking at how blocks uh, price space in them. Right. Yeah, it's certainly interesting. And yeah, yeah, I guess that's the last point I would make here, even though we promised we wouldn't talk about Ethereum is, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, when uh, Ethereum fees were higher, of course, uh, Bitcoiners were dunking on Vitalik for saying the Internet of money should not cost five cents per transaction. And then, you know, of course, it's the inverse from the Ethereum crowd saying that Bitcoin security budget is too low. So I think you're going to garner plenty of criticism, no matter what the fee market looks like on any chain. So. But yeah, we'll we'll, we'll oh, move on 100%. from the the political topics here. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Oh, hash price, yikes! So for any miners out there listening, pull it over your car. I don't know what you need to do because hash price is <laughs> down, and just take a breather because it's it's bad right now. But better days ahead. Uh, we're looking at BTC revenue and difficulty changes on this graphic, and the, the main point is just to understand where the daily revenue and terahash hash has changed based on two inputs, difficulty and price of Bitcoin. Price of Bitcoin has obviously been trending downward since November. We hit a high in November of almost $70,000 and we're hovering around 20K. And then difficulty has definitely increased. I don't actually know the percent change since November, but we've gone up a decent amount since then. Yeah, I'm not I'm not totally sure of the aggregate. And of course, we did discuss this a little bit on our um, Q1 special. So I won't go too in depth on this. But essentially, you know, what we're looking at here, as you mentioned, this is, um, you know, the Bitcoin denominated revenue, um, which responds directly to the difficulty change. So this one doesn't have the Bitcoin price as an input. This is strictly just the amount of Bitcoin being emitted, um, you know, 
on a, a block to block basis. So we can see miners have had a little bit of relief um, since the last couple of months. Um, sort of the Bitcoin denominated revenue, it dropped as low as around 400 sats um, per terahash per second in daily revenue. Um, but at, obviously, as we've had, you know, some of this hash rate pull back, um, it's it's come back to April levels and we're sitting right around 440 uh, sats in daily revenue per terahash per second. So again, you know, when you're looking at strictly Bitcoin denominated revenue, it's a little bit more stable. But then if we jump over to the USD revenue per terahash per second, um, it's it's been nothing but down, even though we've had some downward adjustments, which have sort of relieved the pressure in terms of Bitcoin denominated revenue. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of pressure coming from just the Bitcoin price dropping. So not much positive to say about this, besides maybe you want to spin it as Bitcoin's getting stronger, more hash rate going online. But it's it's been pretty brutal. I mean, that's how it goes, right? So mining is completely based on a, a lot of these bull bear market cycles, right? You're able to really lean into that bull market and build your operation out. And then you're hoping that you are uh, strong enough to go through a bear market and see the other side. Uh, and so we're just starting another cycle over again, where we had a nice bull market, hopefully you built during it. And now we're going to a bear market in your operation. If it's built correctly, you'll remain um, profitable and you'll be able to continue building your operation go and prepare yourself for the bull market. But right now, definitely pretty bleak. Um, like you said, we've seen a few difficulty changes that have been downwards and that's a positive for Bitcoin miners. It means you're going to earn a little bit more sats or you're going to earn a little bit more dollars, but they haven't been like so much to really help you out that much, right? Like hash price right. is still still the lowest since I think like December, 2020, something like that. So it's, it's pretty bleak. Right. And of course, you know, miners are extremely bullish on Bitcoin and a lot of them, their main focus is accumulating Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, you know, your input costs, um, you know, your electricity price is denominated in dollars. And a lot of these miners have also taken out uh, sort of Bitcoin backed loans. So they're getting a lot of pressure on both sides uh, as these loans are being margin called. And they don't have the dollar equivalent to, to meet those demands. So, yeah, really, at the end of the day, the dollar still plays a very important role in Bitcoin mining. You don't say. Yeah, some of those loans are really interesting. Uh, looking at Argo and Bitfarms in particular, I was talking with one of our analysts here at Compass, Anthony Power, and he told me that Argo has a $4 million repayment per month on their loan to Galaxy. And Bitfarms, I believe, is in a similar spot. Um, and that's a tough place to be going into a bear market, right? Where your operation, because of supply chain issues, still might, might not be as strong as you wanted it to be. So you're not getting as much revenue as you wanted. And yet you have to pay off this loan uh, that is denominated in dollars, whether you like it or not. And you don't have the operation on its legs quite yet to get it going. And the purpose of that loan was to get that operation going. But supply chain issues... Lots of different things going on in the Bitcoin mining landscape prohibited people from being able to get those operations up and running. And then that takes a hit when you need to pay off that loan. So I'm interested to see over the next three to six months how some of these loans are either renegotiated or if miners are able to get out of them. Maybe I'm entirely wrong. Maybe they're okay and they can find the capital to get out of these, these problems just fine or maybe Bitcoin rallies, something like that. But uh, looking at the debt market and then looking at this chart right here, hash price or USD revenue uh, per terahash, hash, it's bleak. Like it's tough for a lot of miners out there. If you're a CEO or an executive or mining ops guy and you're looking at your operation and you're looking at this chart, like might turn your stomach a little bit, but you have to keep going through it. Yep, absolutely right. And, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get called out in the comments if I'm wrong here, but I believe the headline I saw a week or two back was, you know, in terms of the total public mining market, there's about four billion in these loans outstanding yeah. backed by ASICs. So, yeah, um, you know, obviously miners have been preferring a hodling strategy and accumulating Bitcoin on their balance sheet, especially as there's been no spot ETF. You know, publicly traded miners have been the perfect substitute for investors looking to get exposure. But at the end of the day, you know, once again, if these loans are denominated in dollars, you're going to have to liquidate some of those treasuries. So, yeah, yeah, it's totally brutal. And uh, if you're liquidating your assets and you're a miner, a lot of times you're just selling into a down market, right? You're selling your 
ASICs into a cheaper ASIC market. You're selling your operational equipment into a cheap, cheaper market for that stuff as well. Selling your Bitcoin downward. So it's, it's tough right now. For those who like really secured their financing during the bull market, they're doing really well. Like as much as Marathon is having problems getting ASICs online, they did very well in the financing market during the bull market. And uh, I think they're going to see the benefit of that over the next few months to years. Absolutely. And and one last point on the publicly traded miners. I do think it's interesting. One of the miners that you've seen, you know, not only not have to liquidate, but continue to accumulate is HUD-8. You know, they came out with a, a pretty flashy press release about how they weren't having to liquidate any of their treasury. Um, and I do think it's interesting because they're one of the few miners that has really leaned into sort of diversifying their, their data centers and doing more traditional data center operations uh, alongside their coin mining. So I do think that strategy is starting to shine here in the bull market, having sort of or bear market, uh, having this non-correlated sort of revenue stream. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if other miners adopt similar strategies going forward. Totally, energy costs is next. This this is an interesting one, uh, one that I don't think a lot of people saw coming. It makes sense given an inflationary environment to see energy costs go up. Energy is everything, right? Everything we do to create economic activity uses energy. But then add a few more inputs in there, specifically the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. And you're going to see some changes in electrical prices, whether you want to or not. So I'll let you describe this first chart. We have a few more. Uh, This is pretty important information. Yeah, absolutely. So what we have here is the year over year change in the industrial electric rate. So this is the electric rate, uh, you know, paid by very large miners uh, on average in the United States. And um, the set of states that I chose to focus on in this instance were the top 10 by hash rate, according to Cambridge's Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. Um, And, you know, they're they're sort of methodology for determining which states have the most hash rate is not perfect. I will say that because it's based on IP addresses. So there, there is some nuance with that. But I do think it is pretty representative of you know some of the stuff we're hearing on the ground in terms of the top states being Georgia, Texas, Kentucky, and others. I'm sure you guys at Compass have plenty of insight into that as well. But yeah, um, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of inflationary pressures in addition to unique pressures on the energy markets. And while the headline numbers for inflation are typically around eight to nine percent, you can see the year over year increase in the industrial electric rate is much higher, reaching as much as 26, 27, 28 percent um, in some of these states like Georgia and Kentucky. Um, but yeah, the majority of them are at least at that you know headline eight or nine percent inflation number, most in the 10 to 20 percent range. Uh, you know, curious exception here. This is Nebraska uh, has had a drop in year over year change. But of course, you know, these are averages. So that might not be necessarily representative of what an actual Bitcoin miner is paying. But yeah. And and again, you know, another uh, nuance here is, you know, these uh, numbers are from EIA.gov. It's a a government resource. So, you know, there there could be some biases uh, sort of embedded in those numbers as well. (laughs) Great Bitcoin. Uh, asterisk there on your data. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah this is, this, yeah, typical Bitcoiner. Uh, don't trust the government there. The Nebraska stuff is definitely interesting. Uh, Nebraska has a large portion of US hash rate. Looking at these other ones, though, it's not super surprising. Um, surprise California is not higher, honestly. And I am wondering when mainstream media grabs a chart like this and then grabs the equivalent, you know, hash rate by state and then puts them together and then starts going after people. That'll be very interesting. Georgia has a lot of hash rate, right? And if their electrical rates are going up, that's a headline issue. And we've seen that be trotted out in the past. I could see it being trotted out in the future. Um, It's definitely a headline right now. Like even today, um, when we're recording this on July the 11th, Texas is in curtailment right now. Uh, they don't have enough energy to hit the grid uh, because everyone is turning on their AC units because of how hot it is down there. And Bitcoin miners are turning off their operations to facilitate that energy getting to the right places. But at the same time, ERCOT doesn't, still does not have enough. Uh, and so there could be some possible like brown outages. I don't think there's going to be any blackouts, but at least there's not enough energy in certain areas. And I'm wondering with such a hot summer going on right now, 
and uh, other states really getting into Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining coming to the focal point for a lot of these states, what the pushback is going to be on a narrative sense. That's what I see whenever I see these energy conversations or these energy charts and graphics is I just see mainstream media headlines about Bitcoin mining. So we get to look forward to those in the future. Right. Yeah, of course, there's been lots of large miners in Texas who have sort of been parading around these uh, demand response programs and talking about how beneficial they are for the grid. And even if it's if if it's true, you know, if there's brownouts in Texas, uh, people are going to find some way to blame the miners. So, you know, we might see people starting to walk back uh, how much they publicize their relationships with the energy providers here. <laughs> totally. Um, jumping over to this next chart, um, this is you know a, a pretty similar chart that takes into account that year-over-year energy increase and just shows the actual impact on the bottom line of miners. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the profit margins for the Ant Miner S19, which is by far um, one of the most popular miners on the market, particularly a large uh, public miner. So, um, you know, of course, the revenue uh, earned by any miner in any state is essentially the same for the same model. But you can see here, due to rising energy costs, uh, it's sort of biting them on both sides. Um, we can see in April 2021, we had revenues of around $35 per day with the Ant Miner S19, um, and maybe around $5 in terms of daily cost to run it. Um, but by April 2022, and again, this is just the, the latest data that we have state by state from EIA.gov. So the picture might have changed in the last month or two. But um, by April of 2022, uh, because of the falling Bitcoin price and rising difficulty, the daily revenue of an S19 was around $20. Um, and at the same time, because of rising energy costs, uh, some miners are paying as much as a dollar or a dollar fifty more per day to operate their machines, which, you know, when you're scaled up with tens of thousands of machines, uh, that, that has a really severe impact on your bottom line. Yeah. For those listening on the podcast, this data is from April. And if I was a miner right now with April data, I'd be very happy. But looking at July data and just knowing from uh, here at Compass and looking at the, the market itself, things have definitely collapsed. And of course, that was going to happen at this point, like bear market capitulation. We've seen all these lenders dump into the market. People are trying to claw back assets. And then the cost of energy over the summer months goes up. But these these revenue, the, the gaps in the revenue and profit are definitely collapsing and shrinking pretty fast. That, that profit margin rather shrinking pretty fast. Where I think a lot of S19s are making maybe like three bucks a day in profit. You're still profitable, which I think is the big thing, right? You can still run your operation and uh, garner some dollars. If you wanna, if you're basing everything in Bitcoin as well, you're still doing great because you get to stack some cheap sats. We did some. Uh, stuff on mining memo about how much does it cost to mine one Bitcoin through the month of June. And you know what? The numbers were actually still pretty good for most levels of S19s, depending on your energy consumption. If you're under seven cents, you're still mining Bitcoin for 50% off the spot purchase of it. So we're just getting back into typical Bitcoin mining territory where you're not going to make you know, crazy percentages of, of margin on your mining operation. You're getting back into the comfortable, like the bear market stuff where you're making a little bit more but you're really basing your operations on future aspects in the growth of Bitcoin. Right. Yep. That's exactly right. And, you know, kind of as, as you hinted, you know, the last data set was sort of state by state and we only have that data for April. But as you can see here, um, you know, we have more up to date numbers for just the average industrial rate paid in the U.S. Um, and yeah, those those margins have absolutely collapsed here in June and July. Uh, it's only a couple of bucks per day that you're making paying the average industrial rate around six to seven cents. But of course, it's it's still profitable. And that that does show um, as we will get into in, in a minute here, the importance of having the, the newest hardware. Yeah. And I want to throw back to the beginning of our conversation at the very beginning, talking about hash rate. And this is why it matters, right? If hash rate is staying pretty sticky around 215 to 230, that means difficulty is not really going anywhere. It's staying around the same place. And that feeds right into your profitability as a miner. If Bitcoin sticks around 20K, basically no idea where Bitcoin is going to go if we go up or down. But if we stay around 20K, difficulty stays around that place. You can still run your mining operation in the green, which is very, very important going forward. That allows you to make better decisions about your Bitcoin mining operation. Maybe you're able to secure cheaper energy. 
Maybe you're able to roll this money into more efficient hardware. Maybe you're able to take some of this Bitcoin, flip it into dollars and get some interest on it. Uh, I wouldn't encourage anyone at this point to take your Bitcoin and try to get interest off of it. But uh, there's definitely a lot of ways to continue making your operation leaner right now because you're still in the green, right? Once we go into the red, it's going to be very difficult to uh, make your operation any better. You're sort of in a stuck place at this point. I am curious though, based on this industrial rate, I, I have two thoughts. One is that there's some people who are not operating at industrial rates. Those are those who got into Bitcoin mining on an industrial level, but secured bad contracts because they thought that they could always stay in the green, right? If you were at an industrial scale, but not an industrial power contract, you're above seven cents at the very least. Uh, and you were just running your mining operation with lots of ASICs, you're going to be in a bad place perhaps. Uh, and you might have thought that you could you could live with these uh, these high rates because of the the great margin, but that's not the case forever, right? And then there's these home miners also that are running at eight to ten cents, maybe even higher. A lot of those people are priced out. When we've seen that with S nines, we don't have that chart here today, but or maybe we do in a second. Uh, but a lot of S nines are just completely off the map. Uh, S17s are also starting to get priced out a little bit unless they have cheap energy. So we're going to see the makeup of the Bitcoin mining market at least change just based on what you have here, S19 profit margins. Right. Yeah, no, uh, you're absolutely right. I didn't include the chart today, but I can tell you as a, a home mining enthusiast myself, my S9 is currently powered down and probably will be until the the winter when I need that free heat. So, but I, I do think it speaks to, you know, at this stage, obviously, the, the main thing you don't have control over is the Bitcoin price. Uh, but, you know, this is going to spur sort of a wave of innovation in terms of, you know, creative energy usage. Of course, we're going to see probably a lot more uh, people focusing on immersion and improving the efficiency of their machines, as well as going after those sort of stranded, uh, you know, oil, gas, um, you know, natural uh, gas fields and uh, negatively priced energy like you see in in Texas on occasion uh, due to the excess wind and solar. So I think, you know, there's going to be a lot more focus on creative procurement of energy sources. Totally. Profit margins, more sad speak. Yeah. 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 So again, as we were hinting at, obviously hardware selection in addition to energy inputs is going to be probably the most important thing, uh, you know, in determining whether or not a miner remains profitable during this bear market. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of your viewers are familiar with, you know, these different models of ASICs. Um, you know, we did include them in the newsletter for those that weren't familiar. Um, but basically for this analysis, we chose to focus on probably historically three of the most popular Bitmain ASICs, which would be the S9, you know, the AK-47 of mining. It's been around since 2016 and it's it's held its uh, sort of a pretty su substantial foothold in terms of the mining market. And then we have the S17, a little bit less reliable, but a, a pretty big leap forward in terms of efficiency from the S9. And then, of course, the darling S19, probably the most popular today. So that's uh, what we chose to focus on for this next analysis here. And um, yeah, this is a comparison side by side of the daily profit by model. Um, just, you know, again, using that average industrial electric rate as your input. And you can see here, um, you know, towards the beginning of 2021, that's when the S9 really came back online in, in terms of a, a machine that was actually profitable to operate. You had a lot of, uh, you know, home miners getting into the game, thinking that, you know, this was going to be a sustainable trend. Um, and, and you could see, for almost the entirety of 2021, those S9s remain profitable. But, you know, we're, we're reaching a point now where the S17 and the S19 and really just the S19 at this point are the only ones in the game that are still profitable to run on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, it's absolutely brutal just looking at this chart. I mean, imagine going from jumping to Bitcoin mining $35 a day and now you're making five bucks a day. And that's really just the the thing about mining, that's how it is. Right. And so I think a lot of people are going to have a rude awakening to what mining is, but then I think they're going to come out on the other side and understand like, this is a business. Things are not always the same. This is not stacking sats on, on a cash app or something else. Like this is very much so a business and you have to go with the swings. You have to make sure your operation is lean because these crunches do happen. Uh, the only reason we have this big upswing on the left side of the chart is because there is going to always be a downswing on the right side of the chart. So we'll see another upswing in the future. And maybe the S17 becomes the new AK-47 of mining or 
maybe at that point, the S19 is the AK47. We'll find out in a few years. Right. Yeah. And I, again, you know, just to add a little bit more context, you know, I think this is why it's important not only to look, you know, if, if you're getting into mining, you don't just want to look at the daily profit as it is, you know, statically today. You want to look at the trend long term because these conditions can change very quickly. And, you know, another way to look at this is the profit margin by model. So, um, you know, what we have plotted out here is essentially, you know, revenue um, minus cost over revenue. So that's that's what you know as the operating profit margin. And you can see here, um, you know, we, we of course, profit margins can go negative. I kept it at zero. Um, if, if it wasn't profitable to operate your ASIC, you know, any rational miner is going to turn it off. Um, but you can see here sort of um, how this lines up with Bitcoin price. And it's, it's also notable that, um, you know, in terms of uh, the operating profit margin, the S17 and the S19 actually tracked pretty closely uh, just because, you know, obviously the electric input cost is a little bit lower on the S17. So for quite a while, the S17 was almost competitive with the S19 in terms of profitability during the bull market. But again, you know, uh, same old story as Bitcoin price drops, uh, profit margins on those older models go to nearly zero, if not zero. Rugged, rugged by ASIC manufacturers. It's a, that's a good chart to, I don't know if I can describe it for the podcast. Honestly, there's too much going on here, but right. we'll definitely get some stuff together either for mining memo or just check it out on our YouTube channel. This is a pretty interesting chart. Just to take a look at. Right. And a little bit pressed for time, but uh, again, you know, this is just another different way of looking at it. As you can see the volatility in terms of the difference between the S19 and the older models, uh, you know, the S9 kind of jumps up and down in terms of, you know, how closely competitive it is with the newer models. Whereas, uh, you know, during the uptrend, the S17 is a little bit more stable. So again, this, this all, you know, just to wrap it up, uh, shows the importance of hardware selection. Hundred percent. Yeah. Once we get more info on S19 XP, M30 FD, uh, M50S rather, and a few other machines, it'll be interesting to put those against some of the, I guess, like mid-generation machines at this point, like the S19. Right. Cool. Last section, I think, for us, we're going into one hop analysis. We're also going to talk about pools for a little bit. Uh, for those who are learning about this, actually, we'll hand over to Parker just a walk us through it, but zero hop and one hop analysis is something that CoinMetrics, Kareem Homie, and a few others uh, came up with. And it's very important for understanding how mining pools and the Bitcoin network uh, move Bitcoin and how miners uh, sell Bitcoin into the open market. It gives a lot of insights into how the supply side of Bitcoin dumps into the demand side. Yep, of course. Yeah, big shout out to Kareem. He he sort of pioneered this field and he actually gave a lot of input into this most recent analysis we did. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of public disclosures from these publicly traded miners, but really it's uh, you know, all about don't trust verify. So we want to see on chain what these miners are actually doing. So just to provide um your viewers a little bit of context, what we mean by this sort of zero hop and one hop heuristic. Um, essentially what we do is we look at the addresses that are receiving payouts um, from Bitcoin mining. So of course, you know, you have your zero hop addresses. Those are any address that is credited with uh, what we call our Coinbase transaction. That's not Coinbase, the exchange. Uh, they they kind of stole that name. Coinbase is the name of a transaction that was, you know, sort of directly paid out from the Bitcoin network. These are, this is how coins are actually generated. And you know, our zero hop addresses, we typically think of them as mining pools because, um, you know, individual miners will pull their hash together and sort of sell it to these mining pools um, for them to, you know, increase the odds of finding a block or to lower the variability in payouts. So again, zero hop is typically representative of your mining pools, whereas your one hop addresses are the miners that are contributing their hash rate to those pools and receiving a payout from that zero hop address. So when you're trying to analyze, you know, what miners are actually doing, typically what you want to do is look at those one hop addresses, since those are the folks that are actually contributing their hash rate to that, that process. So a little bit of a context there. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. Nope. Explained it perfectly. Excellent. 
Um, and so when you're looking on chain at sort of the flow of funds, um, you know, from much of Bitcoin's history, this is, you know, pretty much the same graphic, just showing the actual um, addresses involved. So here, as an example, we see um, two different sets of addresses. We see via BTC pools address, um, 18CBEMR. And, you know, uh, typically mining pools will add a signature whenever they do find a block. So most of the time we can pretty easily identify which mining pool has actually mined that block because they do claim it. Um, and as you can see, that zero hop address owned by Viat or via BTC is receiving issuance. Um, you know, that 6.25 Bitcoin reward flows directly into that address. And then from there, of course, you can see um, funds flowing out of that zero hop address into all the constituent addresses. So this is just a, a sort of snapshot of payouts that were happening from the via BTC pool on June 1st, 2022. And you can see um, while there's only one address being credited in that zero hop transaction, there's dozens and dozens of miners that are contributing to that hashing process and they're all receiving payouts in this instance. Yeah, this is a super cool chart. For those who are just learning about Bitcoin mining payouts, this is definitely some foundational stuff to take a look at. Right. And and of course, there's a lot more detail in our state of the network newsletter. Uh, you know, I have to give Kyle Waters a big shout out here. He's the one who put together a lot of these charts and we sort of workshopped this uh, refinement together because, um, you know, uh, of course, we have these heuristics for identifying one hot miners and who we think are the miners that are contributing their hash rate to these pools. But sometimes these uh, one hop, you know, metrics can be a little bit misleading. Um, you've got a lot of different sort of dynamics in the mix that add a little bit of nuance to interpreting these zero hop and one hop metrics. Um, you can see in this chart that we're showing here, there's a lot of big jumps up and down in terms of, for example, the supply held by one hop miners. And some reasons for that might be that um, some miners, instead of receiving payouts directly to, you know, their own sort of uh, personal wallets or, you know, uh, addresses that they control, a lot of them send payouts directly to exchanges. And so these exchanges can kind of get muddled up in those one hop address sets. Um, and so there's a little bit of nuance that you need to take into account um, when determining what is actually a miner versus an exchange or another entity. And there's other factors you need to take into account as well, because um, our current one hop address set basically takes into account any miner from you know the beginning, the Genesis block that has received a payout, but a lot of these miners aren't really mining anymore. They're not receiving payouts actively. And so um, what we've done is we've essentially started to filter out miners that are no longer actively mining. Um, any address that is no longer actively receiving payouts from a zero hop address. And so actually, if you start sort of trimming down the time frame that you're looking at when looking for one hop entities. Um, if you look at any miner that has ever received a payout from the beginning, from the Genesis block, that's that's a set of addresses that's almost 3 million addresses. But um, as you start trimming it down and you know filtering out any miner that hasn't recently received a one hop payout, that address set gets much smaller going from about 3 million to maybe uh, a couple hundred thousand or a couple 10,000. So that was part of the um, sort of filtering heuristics that we we started to apply when coming up with a more refined methodology for looking at what miners um, are actually active on the network today. Totally. This is a really interesting piece you guys did in Save the Network. So that's all I can really say about it. Just shout out Save the Network again. Uh, definitely go back and read this piece. I think you can find it just on their Substack or on their website. Absolutely. And yeah, again, you know, there's, there's a few other heuristics that we did end up applying and doing this analysis. But the short of it is um, we, we essentially trimmed down the set of addresses that we, we thought were relevant in terms of looking at, you know, which miners are active on the network today. Um, and we came up with a refined set of about 28,000 addresses. And, you know, looking previously at that other chart of one hop supply held by miners. Um, it was very volatile, but we think this set of addresses that we've come up with is sort of a more refined set that shows you what's actually going on um, in terms of the supply being held by miners. Essentially, what we're looking at here is the supply held by you know our, our refined set of one hot miners, uh, reducing the amount of addresses in our set from about 3 million to 28,000. And you can see that this really lines up with what we're seeing in public disclosures. Um, we saw a drop recently 
Um, one hop addresses in this set uh, held about 70,000 up until this period of recent market volatility. Um, and we saw a pretty massive sell off of about 20,000 Bitcoin. And, and, you know, again, we've seen uh, liquidations from large miners like Bitfarms. They sold about 3,000 Bitcoin, half their treasury. And Core Scientific recently sold about 7,000 Bitcoin, which was almost 80% of their treasury. So, you know, we, we sort of use this as a leading indicator for what miners were actually doing. And that ended up having some pretty interesting predictive power in terms of what we saw a few weeks later in the uh, public disclosures there. Yeah, I like seeing that little J right there, uh, that backwards J. It's cool to see on chain that you can tell what people are doing with their treasuries. Uh, it's obviously a little bit of a lagging indicator unless like you're watching this in real time. And the disclosures work just sort of on the other side of this, but is it's pretty cool to see that change happen. And then it's recorded on, on chain. And then we're also seeing like a little uptick, right? People are still online, still hashing, reaccumulating Bitcoin, uh, refilling those treasuries. Right. Exactly. Just repositioning themselves, you know, to ride out this bear market. So hopefully we'll continue to see this go up and to the right. And one last chart I wanted to show here. Um, it's a little bit of a different view in terms of which miners were active rather than, you know, sort of having a start date cut off and saying, OK, which miners have been paid out since the beginning of 2022. In this view, we kind of look at the number of active one hop addresses on a month to month basis. And so you can see this pretty closely tracks, um, you know, our bull and bear markets. Um, you can essentially think of this as the number of people that are receiving payouts, um, you know, during these bull and bear trends. And so, um, for example, you know, in 2011, 2013, we had big spikes up in terms of the number of addresses that were receiving payouts from mining pools. And we saw something very similar in the bull run of 2017. But I think the most interesting thing here is that, you know, after the bull run of 2020, 2021, we did not see the same spike up in terms of active one hop addresses. So there's a few different things you can maybe deduce from that. Um, number one being maybe miners are just getting really bad about privacy and reusing their addresses all the time. Uh, that's, that's certainly a, a possibility. Um, another possibility would be that the mining rewards are flowing to a smaller set of entities. So again, you've seen this big uptick in terms of public miners, you know, mining could become a little bit more centralized. So, you know, again, it's it's not totally totally clear why we're seeing a drop off in the number of active one hop accounts here. Um, but of course, there's a number of theories we could pose. And I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, this is a really interesting chart. It's actually the first time I've come across it. The first thing that sprung to my mind is this very well could be like the best chart showing minor centralization. And that's like not something that's a good thing, obviously, uh, that's literally the whole value proposition behind Bitcoin is getting Bitcoin ASICs in more people's hands. But as ASICs have commodified, become harder to run, and the, the need for higher voltage electricity, the need for uh, a dedicated facility in order to run them, you saw a collapse in the ability for people to run them. I'd be interested to see this one hop account versus something like Ethereum, which is GPU based. I assume it would generally trend the same direction but I would also assume that the trend is not as stark as it is for Bitcoin. And it's pretty huge difference between even the 2017, 2019, we'll call that the bull and bear, and then 2020 to 2021. Uh, big difference there. And what did we see there? We saw A6 really come into form. The S9 obviously allowed you to mine through the 2017 bull market pretty well you could you can mine from home or have a small mining operation um this last one with the s19 s17 pretty hard to run a mining operation without having a facility so i think if anything this chart shows you a uh, centralization of mining uh, but of course there's other things in there just like privacy people reuse addresses all the time so right. great chart yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, and and I think you're exactly right. You know, this chart was sort of motivated by a, a comment that I heard from Ben Gagnon at Bitfarms uh, during the Bitcoin 2022 conference. And essentially his thought was, you know, we tend to look at uh, decentralization as a geographic phenomenon, you know, X amount of miners in China, 
why amount of China or miners in the United States. Um, but of course, a single entity can really run miners across a variety of different geographic regions. Let me jump over to the first example here. You can see, uh, you know, again, this is a snapshot of payouts from slush pool. And it's just like you would expect all the issuance flows to a zero hop account. And then it flows out into a diversity of one hop miners. And you see something pretty similar again with via BTC and F2 pool, which both have pay per share plus. But notably, um, with mining pools that have embraced this full pay per share model, because the amount that's being paid out to miners is the expected value uh, based on the block reward and transaction fees, um, they have to do a lot more sort of consolidation and accounting. So one thing that was kind of surprising that we noticed is that these mining pools only paid out to a single one hop account. And so we can assume that one hop account is probably controlled by the mining pool. And so that has some interesting implications for our one hop set. And again, this, this analysis is in its very earliest stages. So um, we haven't you know, extrapolated all of the implications just yet, but uh, because of this shift in minor payout schedules, uh, it might be time to start also factoring in these two hop accounts uh, that are one set removed from these sort of consolidation addresses that the mining pools are using. Just when I was getting my head wrapped around zero hop and one one hop, we have to add another one. That's exactly. great. Exactly, it's it's always changing. So that's that's really the importance of sort of you know tying together uh, you know your traditional mining heuristics with the things that we're seeing in the industry, like you know public disclosures and changes in pool payout structures and stuff like that. So it's a, a fast evolving field that we all always need to be monitoring. But I think this. Uh, should lend itself so, to some pretty interesting analysis in the future. Hundred percent. Yeah, this is a really interesting analysis. Just breaking down the different payout models and how that leads to different consolidations and payouts for for miners and the different addresses involved. Parker, I think that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast again. Coin Metrics and yourself and, and Kyle, when we can get them, just deliver the best information on mining data. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great.